Welcome to the Young IPA Podcast. I'm James. This is Pete. Good day, everyone. It is episode 180. We got a loaded show for you guys coming up. I don't know, Pete, if you want to give a 180 as per a uh, darts judge. Just to give it a bit 180. of 180. That's what the that. people wanted. So, a uh, loaded show for you guys coming up. We've got two very exciting guests. We have from the American Institute for Economic Research, Jeffrey Tucker, world famous uh, economist. Pete, do you want to talk to him about it? Because this is your big fish. This is a well, very it, good it, find it, by Peter Gregory. It, it was. I had to go to the ends of the earth to get Jeffrey on the show by sending him one message on Twitter. Uh, and no, obviously a very world famous libertarian Austrian economist and has been doing a lot of great stuff on the pandemic. So we just had to get him on the show. Uh, well, obviously, we'll talk more about that in a sec when we play the interview. Yeah, so we bring the interview up a bit just because it's going to touch on so many things that we want to talk about first up. Uh, we also have Jim from Jim's Mowing, which is another big get, uh, mm. going to be talking to us about his battles with the Dan Andrews government, I guess. Uh, for people that don't know the story, the original media release when Victoria went into stage four was that Victoria uh, that mowing services could continue to operate. In the Dan Andrews press conference, it was then reversed that they couldn't. And then the uh, media releases were updated to reflect the Dan Andrew, Daniel Andrews press conference. So interesting warning for Jim from Jim's Mowing that day. So he's going to be talking to us about that, about all of the pressures of businesses across Victoria and across Australia are under right now as a result of restrictions and what they need to get back. And then sort of basically the future of the Australian economy, which is what Jeffrey Tucker talks about as well. Future of the world economy, why he's still optimistic about people's love of liberty and love of freedom and because he wrote an article for the American Institute for Economic Research on Melbourne's specifically Melbourne's lockdown he wanted to talk to us about that and gave some pretty inspiring messages right at the end there as an alarm goes off on my phone but we're going to push through uh, anyway big week for the IPA as well we launched our new video give us back our lives this is Gideon Rosner responding to stage four, responding to some of the restrictions that still exist all around Australia, and we have a little bit for you right now. This week, the Premier of Victoria has imposed what is by far the greatest incursion into our basic liberties that we've ever seen on Australian soil. Almost five million people are under curfew. Private property can be seized by the police minister for any reason. Police can enter your home without a warrant, and stop you in the street to check that you're carrying the permit that allows you to leave your own home. And worst of all, businesses have been closed, jobs have been destroyed, and Victorians everywhere are losing hope. Many shops that have shut their doors will never reopen. Many people who've lost their jobs may never work again. All of this has happened while the government refuses to explain their actions to Parliament which has effectively been shut down since March. The government's actions have no democratic mandate and are not subject to scrutiny or accountability. In fact, under the so-called disaster powers, any law in Victoria can be suspended with the stroke of a pen. We keep hearing that we're all in this together, but that is a lie. No public servant has lost their job, health bureaucrats continue to receive their six-figure salaries, and politicians who have no understanding of the productive economy have received pay rises. Research by the Institute of Public Affairs suggests that stage four lockdowns will rob mainstream Victorians of almost $3.2 billion a week in lost income, prosperity and living standards. And we can expect as many as 300,000 jobs to be lost. Why are we being put through this? Is this cruel and undemocratic lockdown really proportionate to the risk? Will the poverty and mental health crisis be worth it? We at the IPA want to hear your stories. Tell us about how the lockdown has affected you at getintouch at ipa.org.au. Or better yet, head to ipa.org.au forward slash join and become one of the thousands of IPA members who support our research. Because we will never stop making the case for the rule of law, the dignity of work, and freedom, opportunity, and prosperity for every 
Australian. So yeah, we do want to hear from you. It's not just for Victorians. I mean, uh, obviously with stage four, there's going to be a lot of anguish and a lot of stress in Victoria. But I mean, there's still tourism. People working tourism in Queensland are still greatly affected by restrictions. Uh, people that rely on interstate travel for their industries, they're also affected. South Australia just went back to old restrictions as well. So I'm sure that's going to be uh, something that people are going to have to navigate. So we want to hear from people all across Australia. It's get in touch at ipa.org.au. We want to hear from you. Gideon Rosner wants to hear from you. And uh, we're really excited about that video. Pete. Yeah, it's already been viewed 60,000 times, I think Saul just said. So that uh, is incredible. And of course, a lot of people have already got in touch with us. And the thing that has really stood out is that people are lonely and feel like they're alone and that they're the only ones thinking about this stuff. But just want to say that you're not. A lot of people are thinking the same thing. You're not on your own. Bolt gave the email address, get in touch at ipa.org.au. And John, our executive director, has received emails from people saying, uh, I don't agree with the IPA on anything, but you guys are the only ones talking about this. So, yeah, just want people out there to realize they are not alone. Yeah, because like the second you say anything slightly questionable about some of the measures that governments across Australia are taking, you're immediately accused of being a grandma killer, which isn't correct and it's not helpful for people to say that. Uh, so it's always good to know that you're actually standing with thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of Australians. Um, all right, uh, and because of that, we want to talk to Jeffrey Tucker right now. So uh, I think we'll just go straight into that interview. It was really, really great. All right, here we are with a very important interview. Jeffrey Tucker, the editorial director of the Australian Institute, uh, sorry, the American Institute, American Research, author of a couple of books which we'll talk about later, also an affiliate, a uh, research affiliate of the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, who we speak to a lot on this program. Jeffrey, welcome to the program. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. I think you're the first uh, people I've talked to from Melbourne since the lockdowns occurred. So it's really, it's my, my sympathies to you. And, uh, you know, I hope my article helped uh, to some extent. Well, that's exactly why we've got Jeffrey on the program this morning. Now, Jeffrey wrote an article that you might have seen uh, about uh, the, the lockdown. He's been a major critic of the lockdowns around the world and he wrote a piece last week called Madness in Melbourne. Now, out of all the places in the world, what was it that made you write about Melbourne, Jeffrey? Because I effing love Melbourne. I mean, I've been there twice and I love the city. I think it's beautiful. I'm, You know, when I was there, I had a sense that it was like New York without the cruelty, you know? <laughs> I mean, like... <laughs> Everybody was nice. Uh, I love the bridge. There's a bridge there in Melbourne with uh, lovers hanging keys or something. You remember that? And, and the skyscrapers, I went up to the, one of the highest skyscrapers and went up to the top bar and the top floor and had a beautiful cocktail called the Panda where you had to eat the chocolate, you know, uh, and smell the, the eucalyptus leaves at the same time and, just, and look out over the city. It's like everything about Melbourne I, 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 I adore. And... Mostly, I was impressed by the public uh, sector aspects of Melbourne culture. The police were so nice. Every time I would get lost, I'd do that a lot. I would walk up to a, a policeman or, uh, and, and say, how do I get here? And the policeman would always say, oh, here's the way you do it. And I'd say, thank you very much. And they'd always say, no worries, no worries, no worries. And I remember feeling a sense of like, like, this is the way a city should work, you know? Um, I loved being there. There's been many times in my life where I th imagined myself moving to Melbourne. So when I saw um, the horror that had become Melbourne in light of the, this p pandemic, um, I was shocked. Like, I, ca I can't even understand how in a civilized country, something as ghastly as what you've experienced um, has happened. And I must tell you, I wrote that article because many... Uh, Victorians had, uh, that's what you call yourselves, right? Victorians, uh, had written me and saying, saying that they are afraid to speak out because the police now have the authority to just knock on their doors and arrest them uh, or, or fine them for not being home, for failing to arrest them. And, and even the police chief of Melbourne uh, promised on international television that he would smash the windows of any car uh, that refused to unroll them and tell them why they were out and about. So um, my sadness uh towards that situation is what led me to to write and and ask this fundamental question are we really willing to throw out all rights and liberties and everything is special about melbourne all because of um, the appearance of a virus that 
you know, it's a common thing in the whole of human history for a new virus to come along. We manage it through medical purposes, medical reasons, not through public policy. And I, I felt like I needed to say something on behalf of all the people in Melbourne who are now imprisoned in their homes uh, under a, a police state regime that is literally d destroying the civilization that I um, have loved. Yeah, the actions of uh, the government and then the police over the last couple of weeks certainly uh, is brutal. But your criticisms go further than Melbourne's lockdown. I mean, Melbourne's lockdown is probably the harshest in the Western world at right as this moment. But your criticisms are also for the American style and for the British uh, approach as well. So what were your criticisms of the lockdown approach more generally? I don't think it contributes anything to disease mitigation. When a, when a disease is here, we need to let it... Uh, uh, medical professionals deal with it. We don't throw out everything we've learned over the last 1,000, what, maybe 3,000 years of human history um, because of a, a new pathogen. Uh, we, we let our professionals uh, deal with that and not empower our public uh, officials to, to do strange things to us, and, and strange they are. Um, in Melbourne, you've been locked in your home. Well, in New York, two thirds of COVID cases uh, have been contracted at home. You know, so like, uh, has Melbourne learned nothing from the c catastrophes uh, that we've experienced in the United States? Apparently not. You, you know, I don't know who this guy is. He's got a really sort of really sweet name. He's like Dan Andrews. Am I saying that right? Dan. Dan Andrews, how could you be a bad guy with a name like Dan Andrews? And yet he's become a pretentious, pompous, uh, uh, seeming know-it-all who, who imagines that he can just issue these dictates, you know, day after day. And, and it reminded me, his behavior reminded me of many ways of American governors who have done the same thing. You know, they just woke up one day and said, all right, shut your schools, close Broadway, you can't go to the movies. Uh, you have to stay inside. Well, wait, can I stay inside at a restaurant? No, there's COVID inside there. So when we opened up, we can't go in restaurants. Now we have to just stand outside restaurants. And we can now you can go shopping for clothes, but you can't try them on because there's COVID on those clothes. And, and, and three months ago, there was COVID on plastic bags. So no, there's COVID on paper. No, there's COVID on <laughs> bags you brought from home. And then, uh, and then a few months later, and so you have to use plastic because there's no COVID on plastic. Three months later, now the plastic is banned because there's COVID on them and you have to bring a bag from home and so on. Like it's, I went to a restaurant the other day, they couldn't even give us salt and, pa pa uh, salt and pepper shakers because they say there's COVID on them. So like these governments are making things up and they're making us crazy because they're changing their minds every few days. And, uh, you know, we're dealing with a serious issue of science, you know, namely a medical uh, pathogen that is, uh, infects uh, the human body. Uh, human beings have done a million year dance with viruses. We have a thing called immune systems and we figure it out. We figure it out one person at a time, one medical professional at a time. I don't see what lockdowns have to contribute to that. Fortunately, I'm not alone. You know, there's been many studies trying to correlate uh, lockdowns with um, death rates and infection rates, and you wouldn't be surprised to know the result. There's absolutely no correlation whatsoever. There seems to be no relationship whatsoever. The disease does what it's going to do. The virus does what it's going to do. Mostly it achieves herd immunity and then becomes almost harmless, which is what's happened uh, in Sweden. It's what's happened in the Northeast of the United States. Sweden stayed open, Northeast United States shut down. Virus doesn't care about your public policies. So when I saw what's happening to Melbourne happen, I thought, my God, are you not reading the medical literature? Are you not looking at the newspapers? And you know, here's what's remarkable to me about Melbourne in particular. Here we have uh, one of the, possibly the most civilized place on the planet Earth. You know, like a level of uh, graciousness and politeness um, like I've rarely experienced as American, and the level of education in Melbourne among the population, very, very, very high, uh, a rich culture of uh, manners, politeness, and human decency all around. And even under those circumstances, in a, in a flash, practically overnight, uh, you imposed a kind of totalitarian police state where everybody was under threat, even to speak out against it because you feared doing so. To me, that is brutal, inhumane, 
and indecorous and massively inconsistent with what Victoria is all about. And I, I felt like I had to say something about it. And I hope that Melbournians and, and Victorians don't believe the propaganda. Uh, you know, I mean, to my mind, like if you're an American right now who's smart, you would turn off the television, right? So I'm, I'm pretty sure that needs to happen uh, in Victoria too, because the news media has been slavishly uh, repeating the lines of, of these governors, these pretentious uh, know-it-all governors who have no hesitation in putting guns to people's heads and telling you that they think they know what's best for you when, when they don't. So I, I think there's a funny way in which American culture and Australian culture mirror each other um, politically and culturally. Like, I think overall you're superior, by the way. <laughs> but, but, and I, I just see it happening there. You know, I see the same things that we went through like three months ago, you're going through now. And I, 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 I hope desperately to make some kind of minor contribution to stopping it. Well, that's interesting, Jeffrey, that you talk about that connection between Australian and American culture, because we did want to talk about that. One of the things that has sort of depressed us a little bit is the extent to which that people have just absolutely accepted the government uh, completely controlling their lives. And we were sort of thinking that maybe that was less the case in the United States. Did that depress you as well, the extent to which people were just happy to give up their liberties um, and, and the pace at which that happened? Or were you more optimistic about that? Well, you know, I must tell you, uh, honestly, I'm not sure. And and the reason I'm not sure is that I don't trust the public opinion polls. You know, when a pollster calls your phone and says, do you support the lockdowns? What are you going to say? You're like, well, sh sure, sure. sure, sure. <laughs> so, so, right? So I think there's a poll in Australia that 96% of Australians support the closed borders between states, right? 96%. I'm not sure about that. I, I'm not sure because... Um, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, the, the problem is when they stop gatherings, when they, when they arrest you for being out. And in fact, there was a protest in Melbourne the other day, not even a protest, a planned protest. And everybody who's planning the protest got arrested, all right? So if you're prevented from even expressing your point of view, um, how can you really discern what the mood of the public is? I'm not entirely sure that we know for sure. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I can speak to the American question. Um, okay. I'm certain that more people acquiesced to the propaganda than should have. Um, they've been bombarded with propaganda. People forced home. They turn on the te television. They listen to the fake news, you know, day in and day out, repeating a, a bunch of propaganda uh, without any kind of medical understanding at all. And, uh, yeah, they've more Americans have gone along than I expected. But I also think that we're about to experience a huge blowback. After all, we do have a Bill of Rights, we have a constitution, we have slogans in American history about how we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. We sing songs to freedom. The only thing American culture has going for it is that we're devoted to freedom. Everything else sucks. And, 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 and we have Broadway, canceled. We have baseball, canceled. We have bars, canceled. You know, all the things that are essentially American have been abolished in the United States of America. You think that's going to work? I don't think that's going to work. I don't think that over the long term, Americans are going to put up with this. And, and one of the reasons I think the lockdowns are continuing is that the political class is panicked. The minute they take the, their hand off our throat, we're going to scream and we're going to lunge at the political class. That's why they're so afraid to end the lockdowns, because they're afraid of the reaction. They've lied to us. Uh, they've, they've violated our rights, they've destroyed our economy, they've prevented us from traveling. Uh, they've even stopped travel within the United States. That is a human right, as far as I'm concerned. It's a constitutional right. They got rid of all that, uh, willy-nilly, based on an executive dictatorship without ever having asked legislatures any more than uh, Dan Andrews asked uh, Parliament, right? So this is dictatorship. We don't like it. And I think that uh, Victorians are going to wake up uh, soon, as Americans are already waking up right now. And they, uh, the political class and the ruling class right now is terrified about what that looks like. I don't know what it looks like, but it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to agree. I just think people have had so many liberties and so many of the things that they enjoy in life taken away from them. I think this is going to instill like this 
newfound love of freedom and newfound uh, desire to go out and a lot of even the you know before COVID all of the nanny state regulations around the world the I think a few of them will go away because people are just, why is that there? Why, why can't this bar be slightly bigger? Why can't this bar allow me to stand up right now? Uh, anyway, I want to talk to you because uh, at the American Institute for Economic Research, obviously you do a lot of economic research and the effect of lockdowns around the world is going to be very heavy on the economies of the world. So what do you reckon is going to happen to the global economy over the next, like, not even six months, but six years? If, if, the, if the lockdowns had ended four months ago, I think we would have uh, bounced back pretty quickly, despite its egregiousness and despite massive disruption of supply chains. Not to mention the fact that we have a, 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 a U.S. president understands apparently nothing about economics. You know that um, our GDP on an annualized basis collapsed one, one third uh, in the second quarter of, the, of, the, of uh, this calendar year. And instead of doing something about that, he just imposed tariffs, new tariffs against aluminum from Canada. So this guy is a madman and he's bested only by his opponents in Congress who are even more insane than he is. So um, I'm expecting um, a huge blowback against this, but here's the problem. This stuff has gone on too long, too long. Um, we're now in month five of, of insanity. I think the the devastation is going to be palpable. And uh, Sidorus Paribus, I expect we're going to be dealing with this stuff for 10 years. Like, I don't know what you do with, with $3 trillion in new debt or $2 trillion in new uh, money creation by the Federal Reserve. The fact that the Federal Reserve is now involved in policy and buying municipal bonds and buying stocks and buying index funds and um, violating its own charter. Like, I don't know what happens. Uh, um, I think they're going to have to, I think three months ago, we, this stuff was like reparable damage. Uh, now I'm afraid that it's going to be extreme and I'm not sure how we get out of it really. So I'm very actually worried for the future. And I say that as a man who's like wildly optimistic, you know, on the other hand, let's say, let's say tomorrow, uh, the United States, Melbourne, the UK, Brazil, um, everybody wakes up and says, all right, that was dumb. We had a medical issue. We should have let the uh, medicine bin deal with it, right? And we deregulate the economy, open up uh, world trade, uh, stop the inflation, stop the spending, and uh, let business do what business does best and let people be free uh, to travel, to immigrate, to trade. I think under those ideal conditions, we could clean up this mess within uh, two or three years. Um, but those ideal conditions, I'm not sure there's any scenario I can imagine under which this occurs. Um, let, let me just say something really quickly about what I've learned throughout this whole thing, um, which is that if you read uh, Albert Camus, um, his great book, The Plague, which I highly commend to you, actually. It's a brilliant, brilliant work. But he says in there about the plague, when the plague comes, um, the plague does what it's going to do. And everyone imagines that, uh, that every government imagines they can control it. Actually, everybody believes they can control it. They can't. And he said, in light of that, everybody acts in a very stupid way. And then smart people like you, you, and you, and you all think, this is stupid. It, it, it can't possibly last. And then Camus says, but stupid always lasts much longer than you think it can. So I feel like that's the stage of history we're in right now. It's the stupid stage, and it's going to last a lot longer than we believe. It's actually incredible that you bring that up because my dad texted me those passages last night as he's reading it, as is my sister. So I really need to get my hands on this book. So <laughs> everywhere around me, it's just telling me to read this book. Um, <laughs> Another thing we're seeing in these global lockdowns is the resurgence of modern, uh, modern monetary theory. So the ABC, Australia's national broadcaster, they've been airing uh, segments uh, on economists supporting it. The US has printed more money in June than the whole first 200 years after its history. So what is modern monetary theory for our listeners that don't know what it is and why is it so dangerous? Well, modern monetary theory is what you might call a monetary theory that um, rejects monetary theory. Okay, so <laughs> that is very it should be called the, yeah, it should be called the anti-monetary theory theory. 
you know, because uh, they reject basically the equation of exchange. They introduce all kinds of postulates. That, the, the conclusion of which is that, you know, oh, we should be like Weimar. That's going to work out beautiful. Um, and uh, they think that because of 2008, where the Fed created lots of new resources and nothing really happened, they learned from that and said, look, we can, we can uh, fuel the economy forever with uh, monetary money creation. And um, it's, it's mythological and actually anti-modern and anti-scientific. Uh, but these people are vociferous. By the way, it's a tiny cult. It's like a dozen guys, right? So a dozen people. But they're very um, uh, sophisticated on Twitter. And they say things that, that the left wants to believe, which is that endless prosperity is possible out of the printing press. And, uh, and so therefore, they've achieved a certain level of fame. And unfortunately, if Biden gets elected here, he's, he's surrounded by these MMM, MMT people. And that so inflation, hyperinflation becomes a real danger. You know, inflation has been mostly under control in the Western world since about 1980, mostly. Um, but for a variety of reasons. Um, but there's nothing to repeal the laws of nature going on here. And, and if we're not, we're not careful, we could create a, another Weimar very, very quickly. We have to remember that the Central Bank of Germany in, in 1918 and 1919 and 1920 didn't intend to uh, entirely destroy the Reichsmark or destroy society or usher Hitler into power. It was something that happened accidentally because of uh, really bad management of the printing press, right? It was a civilized country, more or less. Still, you generated a hyperinflation that, that tore through society and utterly ripped uh, the shreds of the social fabric and unleashed a kind of nihilism that led to the rise of dictatorship. So, yeah, we should learn from that history and not pursue that path. MMT apparently knows nothing about this. Okay, Jeffrey, let's get on to something a little bit more optimistic. You've written a book. You've written a lot of books as a world-famous uh, economist. Now, I want to talk to you about one of them. The market loves you. Why does the market love you? Why is the market a force for good and benevolence in the world? Uh, the market is about human connection and about about all of us finding value in others and through that exchange, finding value in ourselves. Um, that's the whole book. I mean, it's just a celebration of human exchange and commercial society, uh, which Benjamin Constant said is the, the very essence of what we call modern freedom, you know, in his great essay that he wrote uh, in the uh, early 19th century. The difference between the liberty of the ancients and the moderns, in the ancient world, liberty was just a matter of your political rights. In the modern world, liberty becomes about your commercial freedoms and, and the fact that you have the freedom to ascend in the social order and, and acquire things and spend money that the ancient world never believed in. We broke down hierarchies and, and we developed uh, um, affection for each other. Um, I, I opened the book with, with, uh, with the description of C.S. Lewis's own theory of four loves. Uh, the lowest level, which is basically a, a, a friendship with strangers, you know, right? Which you experience in Melbourne every single day. Um, when you go up to a hot dog stand and buy a hot dog and, and she says, thank you, and you say, thank you. All right, that's a beautiful mutual gift giving exchange. And then that moment you felt a human connection with somebody because they're, they've done something for you, you've done, you've done something for them. And there's an element of magic to that. And the book uh, gradually unfolds in this way. Let's go through all of our commercial exchanges, our coworkers, our, our bosses, uh, uh, the company that we might work for in the future, the way in which I value myself um, more than I otherwise would, the way in which the disgruntlement we feel in life is quite often because, comes because we feel undervalued, right? That's, I think, the source of all disgruntlement in life as we feel undervalued. Uh, the market unleashes our value personally and allows us to express the way in which we appreciate others. Without the marketplace, we wouldn't have this opportunity. You certainly can't do that through the state. And think what's happened to your own personality since you've been locked down, right? I mean, Zoom is cool. It just doesn't quite do it, right? You need to be there with people, uh, looking people in the eye and seeing that 
dignity is universal and that we all have the capacity to contribute to each other's lives. That's what commercial society unleashes. Uh, that's what I think it underscores uh, dignity, humane values, and ultimately becomes the source of, of, of love of ourselves and love of others and love of life. You know, God knows since the lockdowns, we've learned a lot. The world has become a much more hateful place. You know, Melbournians ratting each other out. Oh, I saw a guy walking out there. Please come and check him out. Okay, that's rude. That's evil. That's wicked. Why would you do that to me? Right? I'm a fellow Victorian. Why are you doing that to me? Well, he doesn't love you anymore because you're, you're, you're trash to him. You know, you're just an opportunity to, to, for him to express his political virtue. That's what happens when you get rid of commercial society. People, be, people begin to hate. Unleash commercial society, let people be free, and people discover how to, how to love and, and how to value life and how to live a dignified life life. And we learn about manners and, and ways of being that ennoble ourselves and ennoble other people. So I, yes, I wrote this before the lockdowns came down. I'm glad I did because I think it's a, I think it holds up as a kind of a tribute to what we're missing right now. You also raised something there that I wanted to touch on because a lot of the criticism of free markets and people that believe in the free market is that we're obsessed with economic output and we only see people as uh, their economic worth. Whereas I've, I've always felt socialism is much more of that mindset. I mean, even breaking down from each according to his ability to each according to his need is literally you are your economic output to others. So uh, yeah. is that something that you would agree with? Yes, I mean, Marx's theory was called dialectical materialism, which was basically dial you know, materialism plus Hegel, uh, meaning that the sum total of who we are comes down to like, I don't know, what we own or our social position or what we can pillage from other people or what we can get. Uh, that's not true. You know, I mean, uh, under a liberal philosophy of society, uh, uh, we, we recognize a broad complexity of life itself and that... I don't care how much money is in your bank account. If, if, if you don't love life, you, you're not happy. How often does a raise really make you happy? You know? I mean, once you pay for your cell phone bill, your apartment bill, and you get food in your mouth, you're, you're pretty much taken care of. The only reason we want to get raises and promotions at work is because we want to have signs and symbols of our personal success right? It's not really about the material. We want to be loved and we want opportunity to love. That's, that's all. And that, that's how we learn to live a good and big and important life. That's the only way we're really ultimately happy. It's not, in a funny way, it's not really about the money, you know? Like once your basic needs are taken care of, it really is about, about being valued and living with dignity and uh, becoming a better person. I mean, Marxism has no, or, or socialism has no awareness of that. I mean, like I've read works of Marxism, there's no uh, awareness of our, our higher aspirations as human beings, whereas liberalism has always celebrated um, goodness and decency and um, humane values and big lives and dignified lives and spiritual achievement. The opportunity to become... Um, to live a courageous, heroic life within the framework of freedom. That's the essence of liberalism. And sadly, I think that's been for forgotten. That's exactly right. I think too often we sort of explain the virtues of free markets in terms of the, the, the vastly superior material outputs, but it's more about the things you've just talked about. Now, you wrote a book uh, a while back now called Bourbon for Breakfast. What's that all about? Do you drink bourbon for breakfast? And uh, what's the book about? Well, I've, <laughs> I've had to curb my bourbon for breakfast unfortunately <laughs> so, but I, I would i would I, for a while i did gin for breakfast but even that you know at the age of 56 you have to start being careful but look, the point of the book was to rethink the world around you and it, the the title comes from a a funny breakfast i had but there's this old southern gentleman who actually happens to be a scholar in latin and greek and i went over to his house one morning and he said jeffrey it's so wonderful to have you here i was intimidated because he's a lot smarter than i am and much more Old fashioned. And he said, Would you like some coffee? And I said, Sure. And he said, Would you like some bourbon with that coffee? And I was triggered. I thought, You're not supposed to drink in the morning. 
And then I thought, maybe I can drink in the morning. I said, sure. And I had, I had that glass of bourbon and I thought it was delicious. And <laughs> I enjoyed it. My day went better than it ever had. So after that, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to be bound by conventional wisdom. I'm not going to go along anymore with what the crowd tells me to believe. Like maybe certain things are true, but the, the mob and the media don't recognize it. So I wrote that entire book about things that, are, that I've found to be true that people don't know about, um, but they should. So in a funny way, that's my endure, most enduring work. Um, there is an essay in there, by the way, um, about the 2006 um, avian flu pandemic that never happened. So that was my very first writing about the economics and politics of pandemics. So, <laughs> so that holds up, I actually have to say. It's good. Well, it's Fair only enough. 7.30 here in the morning uh, in, in Melbourne. So there's still time for this bourbon for breakfast. I might run an experiment myself and just see over the course of this show how well I do. Uh, last question I've got for you. You are a uh, bow tie aficionado and uh, every photo of you is with a bow tie. So what does a bow tie have that ties just cannot compete with? <laughs> Thank you for asking. You know, it's the funniest thing. I was working in a men's store when I was something like 16 years old. And the men's store, of course, you have to wear a fa fancy tie all the time. And then one day we got a shipment of bow ties. And I thought, well, what is this? Uh, and so I didn't want to ask anybody at, this, uh, at the store at which I presently worked. But I was in a, like what's called a mall in the United States. So I grabbed one of them. I went down to the competitor's store. I went to the older gentleman. And I said, can you teach me how to tie this bow tie? And he did. And, and by the way, I've never forgot that man. I've, I've, I'll always be grateful to him. And he taught me how to tie it. I put it on, came back to my store. And people were like, oh, you're wearing the bow tie, huh? I said, yeah. And from that, it was wonderful because I, I didn't have the tie flopping around me anymore. I didn't, didn't get in my way. I didn't feel the need to constantly straighten it. And then when I went to lunch and ordered soup, my tie didn't fall in. So I thought, well, you know, this, this bow tie has got a thing going on with it, you know? So after that, um, I never wore a regular tie again. <laughs> so that's and, and, and I, you know, the thing you have to worry about with bow ties is like once you wear them one time, it might be that, um, that you can never go back. So you'll be stuck with a lifetime persona as I am. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for that, Jeffrey. If you want to see more of Jeffrey's work, particularly on the pandemic, but on economics in general, just check out the American Institute Economic uh, American Institute of Economic Research and also find him on Twitter. Jeffrey, thanks so much for your time. Hey, can I just say a very special word to, to all of you from Melbourne? It means a lot to me that you called me tonight and, and to be in touch with you uh, right now um, is a very special experience for me. And I um, there's a funny way in which you're in the same position of many Americans uh, a few months ago, and I just want you to know that you're not alone, um, that you have many Americans thinking about you right now, and we're all in this together. This is the same struggle for all of us. Please don't give up hope. Um, don't despair. Don't despair. These are tough times for everybody. You feel alone right now, but our time is, is coming. You hang in there. You dig deep, find that inner ferocity and that inner belief in, you, in yourself um, and uh, never let yourself give up hope. We're going to emerge from this. Uh, Australians will again travel to the United States and Americans will again travel to Australia. We will be free. We will be free again. So um, don't give up hope. Uh, wake up every day, even though life seems grim, wake up every day and say, today, I'm going to figure out how to survive until this is over. And when this is over, I will never again take my freedom for granted. I will fight for it as long as I live on this earth. So thank you for having me. Okay, thank you too, Jeffrey Tucker. Just an update. I did try the bourbon breakfast. Uh, so Pete, you'll have to manage my performance for the rest of the show. We'll just see if this is something I should be doing in future or if you feel I'm a bit low energy, maybe a bit loose. So <laughs> I don't know, like we'll, we'll come back to that at the end. Um, yeah. Now, we've got a few other stories we want to talk about, and these are pretty grim, but they are important because there's some updated statistics on the economic effects of the lockdown. 
Media release from the IPA on Wednesday found that over 230,000 small businesses are expected to close and 470,000 jobs will be permanently destroyed once COVID-19 support measures are inevitably removed, uh, this being you know, JobKeeper and JobSeeker. And then another report from the consulting firm McKinsey found that 330,000 retail and construction jobs could disappear by March as the federal government winds back stimulus measures. So... Uh, again, you know, if you are concerned about this and you do think some of the measures are a bit heavy handed, then you're not alone. And also, uh, you're standing up for a very, very important thing, which is hundreds of thousands of jobs that are simply not going to come back. Exactly right. And as Kurt Wallace pointed out in the media release that he put out about these figures, he said to mitigate this as far as possible, governments should cut red tape, cut taxes and carve small businesses out of the Fair, Fair Work Act 2009 to support small business recovery. And that is an interesting point. It's small business in particular that are under the pump more so than big business. We know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with big business as well. They provide a lot of jobs, but small businesses are more often a person's life work, something they've put their whole life into to create something beautiful for the people in that community. And unless you want everyone working in big companies and to be, you know, our communities to be full of McDonald's and things like that rather than small local businesses, then uh, keep going the way we're going because we need we need small we need to cut red tape to ensure that those small businesses can continue. Yeah, and a lot of big businesses, I mean, some clearly haven't because they've gone under, but a lot of big businesses do have the money to sort of weather the storm for a few months of coronavirus or at least, mm. you know, be able to stand down without firing some employees, but small businesses just don't. So yep. they're the ones you really got to think about. Uh, and it's, it's really tough and it's going to be a long path back, but these are the issues, these are the points you're going to have to raise and uh, raise them very loudly. All right, another story. We're going to fly through because this is a huge, huge show. Uh, yeah. Another story we want to talk about. So over in Victoria, there was a plans for an anti-mask protest in Melbourne CBD on Sunday. Uh, two search warrants were executed on Thursday night to the organizers of the protest. A uh, Mobile phones and computers were seized. Now, Pete, that seems a bit different to the way the Black Lives Matter was placed. I've actually got what they said here. Luke Cornelius, Victoria Police Assistant Commissioner, said when the Black Lives Matter protests were mooted that the police respected people's rights to protest and that they encouraged people to follow public health directions on social distancing at the event. And now they're going into people's homes for a protest, might I add, that has about you know one thousandth of the amount of attendees uh, as Black Lives Matters. Um, it's just like police, Victoria Police and the Victorian government have absolute forb on this. What your political beliefs are have an impact on whether or not you're allowed to protest and how the police treats you. Just like, just think about that. What your political beliefs are will impact how the police treat you. There's no doubt about that. Even back in 2017, the police sent a bill to Milo Yiannopoulos to pay for the, I think it was 50 or 60 grand to pay for the 50, police. Yeah. yeah, which prevented uh, a left wing riot from occurring or to mitigate the impacts of a left wing riot. They've never explained why they did that. The police in Victoria, for years, treat you differently depending on your political beliefs. And then also, fact. And then also, this protest got uh, nixed before it started and people were having mobile phones and computers seized the day before the event. Another Black Lives Matter protest in Sydney was stopped within the first two minutes of it being protested. So the idea that police could never have done anything to stop the earlier ones, like I, that just doesn't hold up. You can if you want to. But they, exactly. Um, but yeah, for some reason, they just didn't want to. And the other part of this story that really concerns me is just like, you know, I never thought I'd live in a country where you can be arrested and have things seized for incitement to start a protest, like incitement to use your rights of free speech. So it's just showing the level to which individual liberties were taken away in mere seconds over this period and how hard you're going to have to work to get them back because like, that's a lot of undoing to make sure the governments can't do that again. And as Jim Penman uh, points out, uh, Jim's mowing uh, owner, sometimes they get taken away when the Premier just makes a mistake and says the wrong thing in a press conference, which is his belief of how his business got banned during stage four lockdowns. Uh, the other thing is I'd like to make about this point is the Black Lives Matter's uh, protesters, well, more the government and bureaucrats like to point out that no individual has got caught coronavirus at the Black Lives Matters protests. If that's the case, then why is it so unsafe for a number of people who are like one, as I said, one thousandth of the size of the Black Lives Matters protest together and have a protest? You know, if you keep because saying coron it, it was because coronavirus only affects you depending on your political views. I thought this yeah. was, I thought this was scientific grounds. Sorry, I should have become come more prepared. I yes. should have read that in the fine print. 
All right, uh, we'll move over to heroes and villains. A bit of a change up this week because we actually have one of our heroes uh, as an interview. So we're going to start with villains first. So Pete, set it up for us. Yeah, roll the tape, Saul. As Extinction Rebellion protests enter their sixth day. That, of course, is the fake nudie run by Extinction Rebellion last year, which is the award we give for villainy and anti-freedom, the Extinction Rebellion fake nudie run, James. Now, Pete, uh, there was an actual nudie run this week. I wanted to uh, make sure you saw. Did you see? happen to see the German nudist that had his laptop bag taken by a boar? By what? A boar? Yeah, B-O-A-R, not B-O-R-E. Like a wild boar took a man's laptop bag and he had to go find it. And he was... I'm surprised you wouldn't have seen this. I would have thought this would be like on Google's algorithms of sending you news stories you care about. I'm surprised this was one, two, three, and four. Well, Google must be losing their touch. But oh, that's it was, that wasn't Grunt the Pig, was it? That's it wasn't Grunt the Pig. It was, wild the boar, it was a wild boar in Germany. So unless Grunt the Pig has somehow broken coronavirus restrictions, and I wouldn't put that past such a mischievous pig, I think uh, it's something else. Maybe we need to work that into the award somehow. Maybe that can be the new villain or something, or the new hero. It is sort of the meeting of the two, isn't it, really? We've got the hero <laughs> on one side and the villain on the other. Yeah. All right. Uh, my villain this week, I think that's where we were in the show. So basically, the NBA is back, and I'm extremely happy about it, and the Denver Nuggets are playing right now, and I can't wait to finish this show so I can watch a little bit over my lunch break. I'm just that's why you were like, come on, let's do it. <laughs> It's the Lakers, man. It's a big game. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but anyway, the NBA's back. I'm very happy. And, you know, we, we covered this on the show and people also just know about it. The um, social justice logos that are on the back of everyone's jersey. You can choose like equality or Black Lives Matter, education reform. Uh, I finally did see someone that was wearing group economics. Still have no idea what that means, but someone is wearing group economics as his big social justice statement. Now, uh, one of the things I want to bring up, because I don't really care about like what people have on the back of their jerseys but one of the ones i bring up is that lebron james is choosing not to wear any uh symbol at all it's just you know his surname and the number six and any time that he's brought up on tv the commentators will just fall and like oh you know he's not wearing one but he doesn't need to because he doesn't just talk the talk he walks the walk and everyone's just talking about oh how progressive this league is and how great it is to see everyone speak up like am i uh, it was only four months ago that LeBron James said that Daryl Morey was misinformed and not educated about the situation in Hong Kong because he said free Hong Kong. Like, I get it. LeBron has built a school. That's great. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying he hasn't done the other things for other causes. But for this gaslighting of just like how progressive the NBA is at letting players speak their minds freely and standing up for uh, political uh, rights, this was like this year. This was this season. Was that only four months ago? Maybe it was a bit longer. It feels like anything over anything since April was two decades ago. But it was definitely this season of basketball that yeah. uh, where this whole Hong Kong thing stopped. And it's just the idea that we're just supposed to go, oh, no, nah, that was just something else. Well, the thing about sports... Oh, no, what did Mark Cuban say? It was the domestic affair of another nation. The imprisonment of Uyghur... Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, said that the Uyghur stuff was uh, the domestic affairs of another nation. Yeah. Meanwhile... The- I always think with the footy commentators and stuff, whenever they accidentally, well, they're told to sort of, you know, trot out the the lines about politics, they sort of struggle because it's not their area of expertise. And I think one of them heard one of them say that and now they just all say that. But you're absolutely right. LeBron, of course, picks and chooses when he decides to stand up for what's right. And often that decision is based on finances. Uh, you got any more on that? No, you're a villain. My villain is universities lowering academic standards to accommodate international students. A report in the Oz last week said Aussie academics being pressured into dumbing down courses by international students. There was a quote from an anonymous professor at a city university that said, if your exam questions are a bit challenging uh, or written in a way that they're not, that is different from what they've done before, they will complain. There are groups that put together letters to complain signed by 100 students. Those letters go high up in the university and we can get in trouble. So it's sort of not just one or two. It's an organized attempt to uh, get the exam questions that they want. And I don't really blame. I mean, it's probably not the greatest behavior. But like students are always going to try and get out of doing work and get out of, you know, doing difficult exams. And I think international students are absolutely fantastic for the Australian university system overall. But universities, once once again, this are being cowardly and backing down to them. Just tell them that they're, that they're not going to accept that. The fact that they're taking the side of the students uh, and not the sides of the professors means that money is more important than, to them than academic freedom and academic standards. And I don't understand how these people are so reliant on cash 
and can't run a you know a profitable university given everyone wants to go to university and given they get heaps of government funding so uh and we've talked about this i think with kyle williams our uh generation liberty coordinator uh campus coordinator over in western australia um about this very issue and yeah my villain this week is universities backing down I had, a, I had a slightly different reading on this one because to me, it's like the idea is that they're dumbing down their coursework to suit people from different ethnic backgrounds, right? From uh, international students, yeah. Yeah. Seems a little racist to me if you don't think What's they that? can keep up. Seems a little racist if you don't think they can keep up. Well, I guess so. I mean, the universities just want them to pass, but yeah. Hmm. That, well, that, that was my interpretation of that one. Anyway, we'll move over to Heroes. This is a Grunt the Pig Freedom uh, store. The pig may or may not have a German nudist's uh, laptop bag. But anyway, um, my hero this week. So Rachel Baxendale, journalist of the Australian, was one of the journalists, like people would have seen Daniel Andrews get an absolute grilling uh, over the hotel inquiry once it was found out that the judge was not muzzling anyone that they could answer questions but they just weren't Rachel Baxendale was at the next press conference as part of the grilling and then this Twitter mob emerged of just this is not journalism why are you being so hard on Daniel Andrews uh I stand with Dan and I want to highlight this because one no journalist should be the victim of an online mob like what Rachel Baxendale did for just simply doing her job. And second, Parliament is not sitting. Like, these press conferences are literally the only way the government can be held to account right now. And if she's not going to ask tough questions, and if no one else in the press gallery just go, oh, Dan's the greatest, if they're not going to ask tough questions either, then who the hell is? And the other point I'd raise is that the kind of people that tweet out this is in journalism to Rachel Baxendale, exactly the same kind of people. And I hate that, like, why do one people do this when they do it? Why? When usually they're actually two different people. But on this case, these are exactly the same type of people who say Rachel Baxendale went too far, but then Jonathan Swan's viral interview with President Trump over the graphs, that was fair enough. So why is one journalist being too tough and the other one being fantastic? It is actually exactly what journalism is. It yeah. is exactly what journalism is. You're a really powerful person and you're asking them questions to hold them account. And as you say, particularly when there's no parliament at the moment, it's, it's, it's exactly what journalism is. That's all I've got to say on that issue. All right, brilliant. And would you like to introduce our hero slash next guest? Oh, exactly right. Of course, how could I forget? So my hero this week, we're going to do it a little bit differently. We've actually got Jim on the line. Uh, Jim Penman, our owner, founder, operator of Jim's Mowing. Let's get into it. All right, as we said, my hero this week is Jim Penman, founder, owner, operator of Jim's Mowing, the largest and best-known lawn mowing business in the world, I read this week. Also a published author. Jim, how are you going? Well, I'm fine. This last week's been an interesting one, I must say. You know, the Chinese curse, we should live in interesting times, and I've certainly got that one, but... uh... It's going fine. Uh, but look, the hardest thing for me, I'm not. In, I'm in a pretty good situation personally, but I really feel for the people that have been thrown out of work in this thing. It's so hard to take, to hear the stories that we hear, the, the devastation. How can I cope? What can I do? It, it, I hear this all the time, and, it, and it's, it's very. It's, it's hard to take. That's exactly right. Now, of course, you wrote an open letter to the Premier criticising Stage 4 restrictions, which made a big waves in the media. What are your main criticisms of Stage 4 restrictions? Well, I, I don't deny that we need to do things to control the virus, but the point of it is you've got to balance the control of the infection with the economic cost. And what you need to do is to cut down on things that absolutely cause infection, but things that have got very limited in, infection potential, if you cut them down as well, there's, there's other costs. There's, there's, there's mental illness. There's there's There's... There's domestic violence, there's child abuse, there's depression, there's suicide. I mean, all these things are going up dramatically. So what I'm saying is let's focus on cutting down the things that cause infection and not cutting down the things that have no significant risk of infection. Now, this business about a sole operator working alone is a pretty clear case because the initial guidelines by Health and Human Services actually said this is okay. Now, why did they say that? Because after careful consideration of what was probably weeks of method, maybe months, because this was all pre-planned, they said there are certain things that don't cause infection, don't significantly increase the risk of infection. Because a person who's out there mowing lawns or cleaning pools or whatever they're doing, 
they're not actually in the streets. They're not exercising. They're not running. They're not walking. They're not buying fast food. They're not going to the bottle shop. All of those things cause infection. So you're not actually raising the risk of infection one little scrap. And that was clear. And that's why the department actually sent those very carefully considered guidelines. And then what happens is the Premier in a press conference puts a, puts a smashes through every one of those guidelines. Now, why did he do that? Why would you go against the careful advice of your own department as something there's no risk in it and suddenly say you can't mow lawns, you can't clean, okay? There's one very simple thing. He didn't know the guidelines and he just blurted it out. And he threw tens of thousands of Victorians out of work and caused immense pain and immense hurt, mental, financial hurt for no reason at all. And that's what I'm asking for. Follow the advice of your own department, Premier. Or if you're going to change your mind, tell us why. What are the studies? What, what, who's been infected mowing lawns by themselves? Who's, what pool care person has done this alone in a backyard looking after somebody's pool? What infections do they cause? Show us the figures. Why did you change your mind? Because because really what happened is he just he just made a mistake and being a politician he simply said, well I'm not changing my mind because that's politically difficult. I'd rather throw ten fifty thousand Victorians out of work than say I was wrong. But premier the premier is wrong. That's to me is the most extraordinary part was that he says something in a press conference that wasn't across. And look, there's a lot of big decisions being made and I don't think anyone would fault him for not being 100% across every single no. uh, edict made in the last 24 hours. But for them to, after the press conference, for him to go, okay, let's change the advice and let's change the regulations to yes. suit what I said in the time rather than me go and say, okay, I made a mistake. Mm. Uh, mowing is okay. Other contactless delivery services are okay. Uh, the fact that that wasn't the reaction to that is extremely concerning to me. And the other hypocrisy of it is that it's okay for two or three council workers to do a job. They're no risk of infection. But the same job done by an in, on, individual entrepreneur by themselves wearing a mask suddenly is a risk of infection. Where's the sense of that? People are outraged by the inconsistency. Look, when you have a law, people can respect it if it's fair. Now, the Premier thinks it can be as arbitrary as he likes and people will respect the law. That's not how people work. And it's the same thing Black Lives Matter, okay? If you say to people, you can't fish, you can't play golf, you can't do these things, but it's fine for tens of South people throng through the cities. Why? Why is it so inconsistent? Why do they, can they do high-risk activities when I can't do low-risk activities? What's the reason? Let's, let's, have a, let's have the rule of law. Let's have the rule of sense, of evidence, not the rule of the Premier's women and, you know, do what I say, don't ask any questions. That's been a core criticism of mine, actually. I, I, I just, maybe not so much at the start, but particularly after we've been going on with this for six months, how it's so difficult for them to say, right, this is what we're planning to do. This is how many people we think are going to die if we don't do this. This is how many people we think are going to be involved in suicides or whatever if we do do this. Like, why is it so hard to communicate what the thinking behind each of these measures is? Now, I should point out to the listeners, apart from being a successful businessman, you also have a PhD in biohistory. So you're not exactly coming at this from a, from a position of zero knowledge like, I guess, me and Bolter. What, what is biohistory and what, what, does that have much relation to what's going on at the moment? Not really, no. Um, I, oh, did okay. a, <laughs> I did a PhD actually in history in my in my um, back in the seventies, early eighties, um, and came up with some conclusion that what's happening to our society and our world is is basically a biological pattern, and it, it was so wildly unorthodox and revolution at the time. There was no way I was going to get an academic job. Because I'm not really a historian, so that's why I decided to start on my business and trying to fund it. So at the moment, I'm spending about a million dollars a year on a research project, but it's all in, in, in epigenetics and, and, and neuroscience. It's nothing to do with history as such. But we, we think we've got some, some, we've had some very exciting results. We've, we've managed to change behavior in a quite dramatic way, like, like making rats much better mothers and so forth. And we think there's huge potential for, um, for human welfare, and particularly for things like mental illness, really, really big potential. And we should have some results within the next year or two, which are very exciting. That's no, awesome. nothing, nothing to do with the, the lockdown. The only, the only, the only possible relevance is that, that part of the implications of it is that there are certain kinds of changes that people could take, which would make them a lot more resistant to infection. And we are becoming, it seems, less resistant, more likely to catch disease from now on. Um, we could reverse that. 
Very interesting stuff. So back to the lockdown. Now, when Stage 4 was being bought in, there was a lot of anger from business communities because some businesses didn't know until the morning before whether or not they were allowed to stay open over Stage 4. Then you have your fortunes overturned in the Act of One press conference. Since lock, uh, Stage 4 has come in, has it improved at all? And what does businesses in Victoria and all over Australia need as we continue to manage coronavirus from state governments? It's become more and more erratic and wild. No matter what anybody says, you can't rely on it. The Premier will overturn it at anything. It's it's chaotic. I have franchisees contacting me daily to say, can I do this? And I'll say, I haven't got a clue. It's all based on interpretations. Nobody knows. Look, you ring up your state MP, Labor MP, doesn't have a clue what's going on or what the regulations are. I've got franchisees on the phone for hours talking to bureaucrat after bureaucrat. I know literally hours. Somebody said on the, on the phone for four hours trying to get a simple answer. Nobody knows because everything's at the whim of the Premier. There's no certainty. It's, it's a terrible, terrible way to run a state. Jim, let's let's get on to business in general. Apart from coronavirus, of course, you yourself are a successful businessman. You started your career in 1982 with a $24 investment uh, to become, as I said, the largest and best known lawn mowing business in the world. What are the main challenges? Well, firstly, what did 24 bucks back get you back in 1982? And what are the main challenges faced by businesses in Australia today? Well, basically, the twenty-four dollars was from interest in printing. I had an old mower and brush cutter and a trailer at that time, so because I did as a student, but but that was just my initial marketing budget, which was <laughs> pretty crazy. I was not only not only bust, I was I was massively in debt at the time. It was <laughs> not the most, and and then within a week of starting, the worst um, drought in Melbourne history hit, and all the lawns died. So it was it was an oh, interesting no. time to start business. But as far as the challenges today is concerned, look, apart from this whole business, it's it's a fantastic time to be in business. It's actually, it's actually wonderful because Australia is a very wealthy country and, and doing services is, there is a huge demand for what we do. I'd say one thing people don't understand is the potential of the service industry. People are so hung up on becoming a tech billionaire and stuff, which, which is possible, but it's fairly unlikely. They don't understand that... Um, the, the road to wealth is actually far more through businesses like, like ours. Um, there's a wonderful book called The Millionaire Next Door, which is um, about your typical American millionaire. Now, people think that these are tech executives and so forth, but in actual fact, they're not. They're people much more like me, but perhaps a bit less known. They're people who do cleaning and janitorial services and who organize it and grow within that. Not, not, not educated at the university or anything else or, or college. They're just people who've started a basic business providing services and gone from there. Quite many, many of my franchisees are millionaires now. You know, I've got one, I know one guy in New South Wales turning over $2 million a year. He's got three teams on the road, making an absolute fortune. You know, a young guy with no business experience, he's making 400000 a year. We've got these stories all the time. Um, it's it's an incredibly great way to wealth. One of my first franchisees, a guy called Andrew McIntosh, actually, he was um, he bought a lawn mowing round from me beforehand, became a franchisee. He launched a new division. He launched fencing, actually. He became a franchisor. He's now got he's now got a whole stack of big nurseries. He's a building development. This guy is a multi 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 millionaire, and he started doing home services. Uh, that's very frustrating. I wish I knew that before I bought all that Bitcoin. But I want to talk about how uh, <laughs> coronavirus has both become a huge economic uh, burden on all states and territories across Australia and federally. But at the same time, like a lot of IPA research is showing that it's not so much... Uh, it, it, it's not so much creating problems, it's sort of exacerbating old ones, especially to do with red tape. Like the red tape that was existing and holding Australian back in resources and other sectors before coronavirus hit, that's now even worse of a problem. Now, was red tape a problem for your industry coming up and uh, what types of red tape would you want to see repealed as we get back to prosperity? Um, we're not very much affected, actually. Um, the There's the franchising regulations that have come out, the franchising code, which for a company like ours is pretty easy to get around. Um, I think probably, I, I, you're not going to like this when I say it, but in some ways we're not regulated enough. Now, let me give you an example of the franchising industry. There are many good players in the industry, and I don't want to knock them. I mean, I, just as an example, McDonald's, I mean, it's dreadful food, but it's a franchise organization. It's really, they're really spectacularly good. Um, 
but there are some enormous dreadful rip-off merchants and this whole business with retail food group and, and, the, and the way the franchisees are being treated is it just makes my blood boil it's it's horrifying how do you control that now what they did is they did a investigation many years ago and they say well what we need to sort this out is more lawyers and um and business advisors to get involved well garbage what on earth is sending your um your contract to a lawyer tell you about the way you're going to look after your franchisees and and they you have to do a disclosure document the disclosure document is so complicated and complex i struggle to understand it no reasonable buyer of any kind of franchise business would be able to would be able to make have make any sense of it and i've asked them they said there's no point there's no value to this what it does do is is feed lawyers and financial advice because you're supposed to get advice okay and they give no useful advice now what i said to them again and again is this first of all there is one very useful thing about that whole franchising code and that's the idea that you must give to any potential franchisees a full list of your current franchisees with their phone numbers now i've done that ever since 1989 and it works beautifully because that's how we sell it. We said, look, don't believe me, we ring our guys and ask them, and they ring them and they say, Jim's just great, overworked. Some, some don't, but the great majority will say, it's been great, great system, great support, plenty of work, my franchise will look after me, they keep your promises, it's so easy. So for us, it's a good thing, and that's how I built the business. I started off against a much larger competitor, and I used the list. Now, I, so I think providing that list is a really positive thing. The rest of it is garbage. What they ought to do, and, and, and again, I don't know if you're going to be happy with me to say this. They ought to do something more. What they ought to do is to, at the cost of the franchisor, some independent party should contact every franchisee in the country once a year. And it wouldn't be a big cost. And they should make the results publicly available. Now, we do this with our own people every year. So, so it's not a difficult process. It's not expensive. It's not time consuming. And then anybody wants to buy a franchise, they look at this list and they see here's a franchise A here where 90% of the franchisees are happy and they do it again. And here's franchisee B here where 15% would be happy and do it again. Okay. And then you make a decision that would do more than a thousand bureaucrats and lawyers and accountants and everything else. Now, I've suggested them again and again and again. That would sort out, the, that, that would improve the good operators, including our competitors, some of them, and it would sort out the bad ones. But will they do that? No, because it doesn't pay for lawyers. It doesn't pay for, for business advisors. Jim, now, what, how optimistic are you about the next generation? The IPA did a survey a few years back which found that 60% of young people are interested in starting their own business at some point. Do you think that entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well amongst young people in Australia? Yeah, I think it is. I absolutely think it is. One of the problems, though, is that people have the wrong idea about business. People think that business is all about having a smart tech idea and doing something on social media. And look, there's possibilities there. But one of the greatest neglected areas is being willing to work with your hands. And that's considered very low grade. Everybody wants to go to university and get an arts degree these days, but why? Why not go out and start a pool cleaning business or a cleaning business or a gardening business? Now, obviously with our help it's better because, you know, 90 to 95% of independent businesses fail in their first year. With us it's less than 10%. But even to start thing, do it yourself, start at part time, go out, get your hands dirty. Because that's where the opportunities are. You know, the fencing business, for example, you can learn how we have a system for learning, teaching a person how to build very good fences in eight weeks. Eight weeks, okay? Now, we have 60% unserviced leads. Fencing is a brilliant business because it's, it's a great business because there's enormous demand. Once you get a job, you do it well, you do three fences. All the neighbors want new fences. They tend to go down the street like that. It's really easy to get more work. Not only that, but it's a great business to build a team on. So you put workers on and then you get them building with you. And then when you trust them enough, you go and quote the jobs yourself and you put a second team on and a third team and you can build a multi-million dollar business in no time in something like fencing. There are so many examples like that. The work is coming out your ears, do a great job, look after the customers. And it's a really, really easy way to make wealth because most people doing these things don't have much now. So if you've got some entrepreneurial drive, you can do so, so well, so easily. One thing I'm concerned about with the future of entrepreneurial drive, at least here in Victoria, is the way that Daniel Andrews is talking about insecure work is one of the things that's holding back Australia's coronavirus uh, recovery. He says that um, 
Well, so, yeah, so he's basically saying that people <laughs> being Daniel on Daniel Andrews his... talking about holding back recovery. What exactly. a hypocrite. Yeah, yeah. So he's Sorry, basically anyway, saying that yeah, insecure work is making it harder for people to uh, stay home with sick leave and to make these arrangements that he says are necessary in fighting back. I What troubles me is that that kind of language is going to lead to more regulations as to how people can start businesses and more regulations as to how people can operate as sole traders. I mean, you think about like uh, Uber and uh, some of these other apps that allow people to work whatever hours they want for how much they want and just help out individual Australians. Are you worried about that as well? Uh, I, I think it's I think it's super. But let's, let's say something about Uber. Now, the interesting thing about Uber is this. The taxi industry has been a closed cartel for a long time because people pay for the medallions. That's how it worked. Now, what's the point of that? OK, it doesn't help the individual taxi drivers because most of them are working for somebody who's got a medallion. So they're not they're not in benefit at all. Um, what it does is is put the wealth into the into a, into a into a minority of property owners. Now, what it does then is it drives the the price up and the service down for the consumers at the expense of screwing the workers. That that's what the government has done. Now, what a, the sensible thing to do would be simply open up the taxi industry to say, look. You pass an exam, you put your details in for security purposes, and you can run a taxi. Okay, now if you want to cooperate with somebody, you can, but you can provide the service. But that wouldn't be allowed because only the ordinary taxi drivers would benefit, wouldn't they? So that's not good because it doesn't represent the people who've got the money and the power. But when a billionaire, multi billion dollar company like Uber comes in, oh, yes, we'll listen to you because you're rich because you can afford to lobby, because you can afford to, to just pay for $1,000 plates sitting next to ministers at dinner. That, that's the ludicrous thing. All these regulations actually help to entrench the power of wealth and to screw the little guy. That's exactly right, Jim. Now, you have also written a couple of books, uh, so a bit of an all-rounder. What, what are they about, and uh, how did you find the time, to be honest? <laughs> well, I don't know. Often you get up early in the morning and you, do, you can do anything if you get up an, an hour earlier every day. Um, I've written my book. There's, there's a book about me I've written myself, which is called um, – the latest version is uh, – What's it called? Every Customer a Fan. You can download that from our website, www.gyms.net, including an audio version too. There's another one called Jim's Book, which is interviews with me, which is kind of like a bit more personal because people say things about me. Not, not always good either too. So, so there's, you can find that. There's a lot of stuff on the website. If you, you'll see far more about me than you ever wanted to know on, on our website. So there's a section called Meet Jim. And, and by you, who is this guy? He's all over the place. Even even a typical day in the light shows me in a, in a um, playing squash very badly, I might say, and, and all kinds of stuff, handling emails. It's, it's, it's fun stuff. But uh, you've always got time to do things. I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm bone idle, lazy, but my, everybody tells me I'm a workaholic, so <laughs> who knows? Yeah, my mornings mainly consist of either sleeping or wishing I was asleep, so uh, <laughs> I need to work on that side of my life. But anyway, Jim, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you too, Jim. We've got three stories loaded show this week, so we've just kept it to three stories that made us laugh this week, and I think we're going to start off with the humble worm, Peter. Great energy from Jim there. That was a really good chat. Now, let's get into worms. Now, you would have thought, probably I should know better that, than, that, that this could happen in 2020, but I was surprised that this happened on July 18. A woman called Ellen Weatherford, co-host of the Just the Zoo of Us podcast, good name, Great tweeted, name. Out, Great name. Tweeted, tweeted out a simple question. What is the most overhyped animal? So that's obviously science animal type program. James, do you have an answer to that? Do you have a Cat. A, cat? Not even close. The cat is the most overrated animal in the world. Well, one of the... I, I just reckon animals in general are overhyped. Just kidding. Love animals. Uh, no, no. Science, no say, say your truth. Say your truth. You think animals are overrated, specifically dogs. <laughs> I'm, I'm outing you as this. You are a dog hater. You're not outing me. We've talked about it about six times on the podcast, but uh, I'm not a dog hater. I just don't get it the way other people get it. I see other people getting really... When they see a dog, their whole you know manner trans like transforming that mm -hmm. impact just doesn't happen on me That's and me. i get I that i will talk to the dog i say yeah. good morning how's it going and i go to the footy and it's just like 40 blokes i don't know chasing after a piece of leather and i go crazy and i get why people would find that weird that's how i find the dog thing anyway some of the answers from the most overhyped animal were blue whales lions and penguins uh now then michael eason editor of e-life entered the fray and he shouldn't have 
He tweeted, C. elegans, which are the humble roundworm, for those that don't know. C. elegans. This is the most overhyped animal. They wiggle forward, they wiggle backwards, and occasionally they F themselves. That's it, which is apparently true. Um, so you would have thought that would be a pretty safe bet. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang, hang it on this worm and everyone will think it's funny and then we'll move on. Nah, this is 2020, Michael. Uh, and bagging worms, he's racist, sexist, and lots of other bad stuff. Firstly, he got in trouble for saying the F word. Secondly, he got in trouble for frat boy humor, uh, which I don't know where that leaves us, mate, but um, apparently not on science Twitter. Uh, got tweets about how the science are actually really valuable in learning about the world. Uh, Eason himself had to tweet the next day and try and backtrack. He said something can both be an amazing model system and an incredibly boring creature. Uh, so one might even say the latter is an advantage for the former. So he's on the defensive. He apologised to the mob, which he shouldn't have done. Uh, and eventually went on. So went on from basically stop bagging worms. I really rely on my research for the worms to... Uh, jokes about worms are the same as jokes about women and people of colour, which is, I guess, a little offensive to say that bagging a worm is the same as like slavery and oppression and things like that. But anyway, that's what they went with. Uh, and I'm not talking about this isn't just random activists. This is academics, science academics, uh, diversity people. I'll give you an example here. It's not a joke about worms. It's about the bystander effect and how that works for the privileged. Um, it's just a joke. Women and POC have heard that one before. Uh, no, that was my favourite one. Uh, it made me really sad because I've heard this a lot from people who couldn't accept my choices. As an editor of e Life and model system supporter, he should have been more careful. The worms got hurt, I got sad, and I lost my enthusiasm. James, what are your thoughts? If you thought the people protesting police brutality in America had their cause hijacked by someone that, like, hijacked by a group that didn't have their best interests at heart, these these people have got some news for you. Like that was just the zoo of us thought this will be the most innocent like segment starter of a joke ever, and yeah. then bang. I reckon Michael Eason's been sitting on that joke gag. I reckon it sounds like the kind of joke he's probably made like all around the lab a few times. And he's like, I've got a killer lined up here, you know, because apparently they do do that. Apparently they procreate themselves. Um, in, in case anyone you've was wondering, yeah, you've you've said it twice. <laughs> I can see where the majority of the research for this week's show went into. It is amazing. Anyway, there you go. Worms are racist. All right. Speaking of uh, the work takeover of science, so NASA will no longer refer to planets or planetary systems with derogatory names. Uh, bear with me as this gets scientific, but uh, as an initial step, NASA will no longer refer to the planetary nebula NGC 2392, which is a glowing remains of a sun-like star that blowing off its outer layers at the end of its life as the Eskimo Nebula, Eskimo being the offensive term. Uh, NASA will also no longer use the term Siamese Twin Galaxy to refer to a pair of spiral galaxies found in the Virgo Galaxy Cluster. So Siamese Twins, Eskimo, too much. But I reckon, Pete, if NASA's Dinkum, and I think everyone's already arrived at the joke I'm about to make, but if NASA's seriously going to get rid of woke culture in science, you've got to go after black holes. That is, right. That's the white whale of the industry. And then and I would say then literary figures have to stop saying white whale because that's their white whale. Exactly right. What is, can you explain to me what a black hole is again? Just Because if it's a good thing... Then... So it's sort of like when energy dissipates into a circle and then becomes absolutely nothing, I think. I'd compare <laughs> it to a conversation with you. <laughs> we, should have got, we should have asked Jim. Jim does bio. Oh, I thought you were setting me up for a joke, so I'm like, I better get one in before he hits me with a hammer blow. <laughs> No, I was just trying to work out what a black hole was because if it's something good, then maybe it's not offensive to call it a black hole. But um, am I completely racist for not knowing why Eskimo Nebula is offensive? Is that... Uh, I think it's just Inuit. You're supposed to say Inuits. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. Because I can be get wrong. Siamese Twins Galaxy. It's like Siamese, you know, like Siamese Twins is like... Conjoined Twins. Know, yeah, yeah, so to yeah. call it a nationality, I guess, is a little bit offensive. But yeah, NASA renaming stuff. No need to worry about slavery anymore because NASA's renamed the planets. Yeah, exactly. All right, last one we want to get to. So obviously the US election coming down. We talked with Greg Sheridan recently about uh, the state of Joe Biden's mental condition and we just want to play this footage and just reassure everyone as Biden says that he's fine. Please clarify specifically, have you taken a cognitive no, test? No, I haven't taken a test. Why the hell would I take a test? Come on, man. That's like saying you, before you got in this program, you take a test where you're taking cocaine or not. What do you think, huh? Are, are you a junkie? What do you say to <laughs> President Trump who brags about his test and makes your mental state an issue for voters? Well, 
If he can't figure out the difference between an elephant and a lion, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Did you watch that? Look, come on, man. I, I, I know you're trying to goad me, but I mean, I'm so forward looking to have an opportunity to sit with the president or stand with the president in debates. There can be plenty of time. And by the way, as I joke with him, you know, it, I, I shouldn't say it. I'm going to say something I don't, I, I probably shouldn't say. No further questions, Pete. Mate, he's fine. Like, he's he's absolutely ready to govern the most powerful country in the history of the world. I think that what that interview showed is the two sides to Biden, the old Biden, which was the fun, loose, crazy one when he was fighting Corn Pop. And uh, Corn Pop's right, isn't it? Corn Pop is correct, all right? You put some respect right. on your lips when you say his name. That's right. And he was saying, what are you, I'm cocaine man? And then there's the sad Biden, which came in that he's uh, really old now and they're, you know, using him for themselves. Anyway... <laughs> we don't want to end the show on such a negative note. What we do want to end the show on is talking about James and his bourbon experiment. We know Jeffrey Tucker said to have bourbon for breakfast because that is the road to success. James did that this morning. James, how do you reckon you went? How do you feel? I, I'm pretty happy with the performance I put in. It's not up for mm. me to say, but I think uh, my energy's been up. I think I've been across my brief. I don't think it would have affected me negatively, but it's just about mm. to what degree of positive had it affected me. So... I mean, Pete, you, you've been with me this entire journey through this show. What do you reckon? I think you've seemed a little bit more alive, a little bit more happy. Yeah. You know? So we might get inside. you, producer Saul, we might get you to turn your microphone on. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the matter? Oh, Saul, I didn't know this was coming. Yeah, I thought um, James was uh, <laughs> the most energetic he's ever been on this podcast, actually. Um, <laughs> and I think the uh, Johnny Walker blue label is actually working well. So uh, keep it coming. <laughs> Bit of an insight into the inner James Bolt for everyone out there. Saul said, this is the most positive you've ever been. Whereas any functioning human being would take that as a compliment. I went, does that mean I've done 179 episodes with bad energy? <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's my right, little yeah. first thought. Well, but you need to have another bourbon, mate. That's meant to stop that. But uh, yeah, we should point out James had one bourbon at breakfast. He hasn't been drinking all morning. Uh, that's all I got. All right, sweet. Um, well, well, we'll we'll reconvene at a later date as to whether or not this is a practice going forward. All right, that is it for the show this week. Those thank you to Jeffrey Tucker, not only for the breakfast tips, but also for a wonderful interview. And thank you also to Jim from Jim's Mowing. That was uh, a really great discussion about all the chaos that's happening to businesses in Victoria and all the stresses that businesses all across Australia are under. If you like the show, make sure you're listening to us. Uh, sorry, make sure you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and family about the show. We're available on any podcast platform uh, so they can listen to us wherever they want. Um, make sure you're listening to the other podcasts that we've got here at the IPA. We've obviously got Looking Forward out every single week. We also have Five Favourite Books with Dr. Bella Debrera and Greg Sheridan. We have Viral Banter with our Generation Liberty campus coordinators and Renee Gorman. And we also have Australia's Future, which is a really awesome podcast between former Prime Minister Tony Abbott and John Roskam, just about the Australian way of life and how to protect it and uh, cultivate it through coronavirus restrictions. So... Really, a uh, whole bunch of stuff we've got going on. So make sure you're getting in touch and uh, make sure you're spreading the word about all the podcasts that we got here at the IPA. So thank you guys and see you guys next week. See you later.